Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to continue off the work of Max Planck onto the work of Danish scientific superstar Niels Bohr, and also a very accomplished uh, football player in his time. And we'll talk about his contributions to atomic theory. Uh, Bohr built off the work of a lot of people, not the least of which was Albert Einstein, who built off the work of Max Planck, who was actually discovered by Max Planck. Um, and helped him rise to stardom in the world of physis, physics. Anyway, so uh, Einstein built on Planck's discovery of, of quantized energy and in fact used it to help explain the photoelectric effect. And one of the things that Einstein realized uh, is that um, to make sense of Planck's model of quantized energy, uh, it, would, it would make a lot of sense if energy was indeed carried uh, in packets. Uh, so not only did it come in these little uh, Planck steps, uh, but that those Planck steps of energy were due to the fact that, that energy was carried by very tiny particles called photons. Because uh, he called them photons because Einstein was a gigantic, gigantic fan of Star Trek. And so um, what we could do is take the equation, Planck's equation of E equals H nu, and then just change E, that delta E, uh, to just the energy of the photon. And again, we can look at it from terms of uh, frequency or wavelength, totally up to you. Now, Einstein had a couple of amazing papers very early in his life, and one of them was the special theory of relativity, um, where he, of course, introduced the world to E equals mc squared, and the important thing about that is that there was now an equivalence between energy and matter. Now, again, C is a gigantic number, and squaring it is even a greater number, but that would eventually lead to the ramifications of, of being able to tap into the energy inherent in unstable matter. And now, one of the things to understand is that things like photon, we're, we are going to measure the mass of photons, uh, but remember that if something travels at the speed of light, it can't have any mass. Uh, and if you, if you haven't studied uh, relativity or anything like that, don't worry about that yet. But um, at, at rest, a photon technically has no mass, um, but due to the special uh, abilities of relativity, um, it can have a sort of a relativistic mass. And again, you know, physicists out there, I'm sure you're... Uh, cringing at my descriptions of this, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, from our frame of reference, it has, it has a momentum and energy and a mass that we can measure, um, although technically a photon has no mass at rest, but we never see a photon at rest, so go figure. <laughs> but anyway, um, so what we could do is we could, we, could, we could calculate the relativistic mass of a photon if we wanted to. Uh, now, now, again, uh, one of the things I want you to take away from this little part right here is not necessarily the, the answers and the numeric answers, but notice what we can do and manipulating equations and substituting in and watching units. That's the important part of this, I think, for a chemistry student. So anyway, so we can account for the fact that the E of a photon, the energy of a photon, equals the mass of a photon, the relativistic mass of a photon, times C squared. We can isolate mass. And so we just divide each side by c squared. And remember that what we decided about the energy of a photon, uh, energy equals Planck's constant times nu or Planck's constant times c over lambda. So what we can do is we can substitute c, uh, Planck's constant c over lambda in for the energy of a photon and end up with this equation. So we can have uh, hc over c squared lambda. And of course, we can cancel out one of the c's and we have a brand new equation that the relativistic mass of a photon would equal Planck's constant over wavelength times c. Which again isn't that crazy, it's, it really is just saying that the energy of a photon is now inversely proportional to wavelength, which we already knew, uh, because there are two constants, Planck's constant and c, already in there. So look what we can do. We can of course change wavelength to meters. Again, you don't have to change wavelength to meters, you could certainly change the speed of light to uh, nanometers per second, but that sounds like a lot of work. So here we are, we have now our equation that uh, the mass, the relativistic mass of a photon equals Planck's constant over C lambda, and then we just plug stuff in. Now this is going to look incredibly scary, but it's not. We have a constant over a constant, and then we also have uh, the wavelength. So there's really only one variable in here. And what's really interesting about this is how it ends up to be kilograms, because I don't see kilograms anywhere in there. So the relativistic mass of this photon uh, would be about 4,000 times smaller than an electron, which is, again, very, very tiny because an electron is 2,000 times smaller than a proton. 
And in theory, the photon doesn't have a mass at all, but anyway. So let's look to see, and, and this is, I think, the interesting part, is where, where do those units work out? So let's get rid of the numbers, get rid of those. Let's, let's look, look at the units. Now remember what, what Joule stands for. Joule stands for kilograms meter squared over second squared. And so what we can do is we can go ahead and substitute that in there, a little mathematical magic here. And then everything cancels out. Look at this, meters over meters cancels out, seconds over seconds cancels out. And so we're left with just kilograms. So it's kind of fun to remember that embedded in the term, joules are kilograms. So fun with units. Now, the dual nature of light was verified by an American, Arthur Compton. Um, he, he was studying uh, essentially what's called the Compton effect now, and where he found that if you hit a photon with something like an electron, um, it, 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 it came out of that collision with less energy. Um, uh, and, and so to explain this, uh, you couldn't explain it by saying that light was a wave. Light had to have particle properties. And so that, that experimentally verified Einstein's idea that energy, I mean, yeah, energy could act like a wave or a particle and, and does both at the same time, depending on how you test it. And so that was kind of neat that Compton was able to do that. Um, and, and again, we'll quickly run through some terminology here, uh, which will come in handy when we talk about light. There's, of course, monochromatic, which means single wavelength, like a, like a laser. Um, or polychromatic, you have multiple uh, wavelengths present, like incandescent light, natural light. You'll see several of them. In fact, if we look at this um, in a, a through a spectrum, you'll either see lines or a broad spectrum. Remember, of course, that most electromagnetic radiation is outside our realm of existence. Not realm of existence, but realm of detection. And so you can see a continuous spectrum there or a line spectrum. And we've talked about line spectrums before. They've been used to identify stuff for a long time. And hydrogens is the reason we're talking about all this stuff right now. And so people knew for a long time that hydrogen gave off a certain bright line spectrum. Uh, and back in the, in the late 19th century, a, a Swiss school teacher figured out there's a mathematical relationship between these lines. And again, the fact that these lines exist is, is really, really intriguing. There's probably some mystery behind this. But it would take a long time for somebody to explain this. And the person who came into play was this, uh, again, our Danish superstar, um, Niels Bohr. And so he attempted to account for uh, the hydrogen spectrum by, inc by incorporating many of the discoveries at the time. Good friends with Einstein, of course. Uh, all the big players were at that time. And so Rutherford knew there, there was a planetary model. And the planetary model was a great idea, but immediately collapsed under uh, the, the scrutiny of classic physics. Because uh, when, when those electrons were in circular motion, they would have immediately spun, uh, lost, lost energy and spun into the nucleus. So theoretically, if, if, if we only have classic physics, then atoms can't exist. And of course, that's not true. So something was going on there. And then we had Planck and Einstein's realization that energy was quantized. And, and uh, you know, it's just, just a, a brilliant idea that, that Bohr was able to put this together. And so what, what Bohr did, uh, not only uh, did he ask questions about hippo in a bathtub, but he came up with, with a pretty simple explanation for this. I mean, again, it was very complex, but the basic idea was that he said that, um, well, if, if uh, electrons can't fall into the nucleus, then, then they can't, <laughs> and that they can only exist in certain places. And so there was only certain distances from a nucleus that electrons could exist, like the rungs on a ladder. And these were called allowed energy states. All right? And, and how they jumped from energy to edit state to energy state was based on the idea of quantized energy. All right, so they either uh, absorbed or released radiant energy, and, and it lined exactly up with what Planck had predicted through E equals Planck's constant times nu. And these did not physically move from energy level to energy level. They actually changed existence. They existed on one or then existed on the other. There was no movement between rungs. You couldn't hover in between. They simply existed between one or the other. Now, Bohr didn't actually understand why this all happened, but it was really the only explanation that made sense. And, and we'll talk about in the next video, uh, quickly and, and very simply, kind of talk about some of, the, some of the justifications for this model. And so Bohr's model of hydrogen really was, you know, an amazing idea. Now, we don't use it today, um, uh, but, but, you know, the fundamental basics were really important. You know, again, we want to avoid too much using visual models to explain this stuff, but the electrons could only exist at certain rungs. And they never could fall into the nucleus because Bohr simply said that, well, they simply can't. For some reason, electrons cannot go beneath that certain point. And there's a reason for that. There's a lowest allowed energy level, also known as the ground state. And Bohr would end up winning the 1922 Nobel Prize for this. Um, his model never really uh, explained anything well behind hydrogen, but the, but the idea of quantized energy and, and uh, 
you know, accounting for the energy jump from level to level remains with the atom to this day. Interesting, uh, again, Niels Bohr um, uh, was, was, did not in, like the Nazis at all and was able to be tipped off when the, when the Nazis were going to come after him in Denmark. He fled to Sweden um, and then worked his way over to England and worked there for a bit, um, doing working some time with, um, with the Atomic Project, too. And Niels Bohr really was one of those gigantic scientific figures. And again, he, he struggled with the ramifications of modern atomic theory like many other people. Um, and was involved with a with one of the uh, unsuccessful uh, explanations of quantum theory later, but his contributions to early atomic theory um, uh, certainly cannot be uh, overstated. And so that's it for today. Next time we'll we'll try to wrap up our, our very brief and and somewhat I'm sure uh, uh, over simplistic view of modern atomic theory by talking about some of the other people who took us to our modern view of the atom. So thanks for watching. Bye. Keep learning about modern atomic theory and have a great day.